To have one murder in one's vicarage is unfortunate. To have a second looks remarkably like carelessness or worse. It was to no avail that I protested that the dead maid in the kitchen was not our maid. The unfortunate fact that she had formerly occupied that role was enough to set the tongues of St. Mary Mead wagging more eagerly than the tails of a pack of hounds catching the scent of a fox. To make matters worse, my wife had made no secret of our delight at Mary's departure from our employ. Dear Griselda has many fine qualities, but the discretion that befits a vicar's wife is not among them. In fairness, however, anyone who had ever dined with us could bear testament to the literally diabolical nature of Mary's cooking. On one occasion, she put a pan of eggs on the stove to boil and promptly forgot about them. The pan boiled dry, the eggs exploded, filling the house with a dark, sulphurous reek. I imagine this is how the outskirts of hell will smell, our neighbour Miss Marple remarked with a twinkle when she arrived later for lunch. It took three coats of paint to restore the kitchen ceiling. So we felt no sadness when, on hearing that my wife was with child, Mary announced she was leaving us, because she couldn't abide children in general and babies in particular. Miss Marple, who has an admirable record in training young women for domestic service, came to our rescue. Flora has all the qualities Mary lacked. She is reliable, capable, and devoted to our son David. She is a good plain cook and an even better baker. Griselda further maintains she has a face like a policeman's boot, which she claims will discourage backdoor suitors like Bill Archer, who courted Mary until his death only a week ago. According to Miss Hartnell, the heartiest of our village spinsters, Archer had been hoist by his own petard. That he was a poacher was no secret, but then there are few secrets in a village like St. Mary Mead, thanks to what Griselda calls the clouder of old cats, who are swifter with the news than the BBC, though on occasion less accurate. But I digress. Archer had cooked up a stew of one of Colonel Bantry's pheasants, bulked out with wild mushrooms. Although he was an experienced forager, somehow he managed to incorporate sufficient poisonous fungi to have fatal effects. A passing farm labourer was alerted by the anguished barking of Archer's Jack Russell terrier. He peered through the kitchen window and saw Archer lying on the floor amidst a scatter of broken crockery and a smashed beer bottle. Despite Archer's well-known proclivity for helping himself to other men's produce, the local police did not take his death lightly. Inspector Slack, a misnomer if ever there was one, arrived from Much Benham with his usual flurry of self-importance. He bossed everyone around for the best part of a day, then locked up the cottage and placed a seal on the door. A fat lot of use that'll be. Any idiot could get inside that ramshackle hovel of archers in a matter of minutes, observed my nephew Dennis, whose year as a probationary police constable has rendered him an expert on all matters criminal. It seemed, however, that even Inspector Slack could find no grounds for suspecting foul play. Only that morning, Miss Marple had stopped me as I passed the bottom of her garden. "'Have you heard when Archer's funeral is to be held?' she asked. "'I'm afraid his family can make no plans until the police release his body. "'Had you not heard? The coroner has concluded his death was from natural causes. "'They removed the seal on his cottage yesterday morning. "'I believe Mary has already visited. It was her afternoon off.' Of course, Miss Marple would know the schedule of every domestic servant in the village. But even Miss Marple could not have predicted that I would walk into my kitchen after our conversation to find the selfsame Mary lying on the flagged floor, her head in a pool of blood, a cast-iron omelette pan discarded next to her. Though I feared she was dead, I did crouch beside her and feel for a pulse in her wrist. Not only was there no flutter, her skin was cool to the touch. I straightened up and made for the phone in the hall. 
much to the chagrin of Mrs. Price Ridley, Miss Hartnell, and Miss Weatherby, we have no village bobby here in St. Mary Mead. Just as well, says Dennis, who is already the perpetual target of their complaints. So I was obliged to ring much Benham, where Inspector Slack holds sway. I had hoped he might be out on an investigation, but as soon as I said, dead body, I was transferred via a series of clicks and buzzes to the man himself. Mr. Clement, he snapped, what's this about a dead body in your kitchen? I explained what I had discovered. There was a long silence, then Slack harumphed down the line. I'd have thought one murder in the vicarage would be enough for any man of the cloth. He paused. I had no idea what he expected me to say, so I remained silent. Eventually he sighed. Don't touch anything. We'll be with you shortly. The bang of the phone receiver hitting its rest reverberated unpleasantly through my head. Slack was as good as his word, arriving with Dennis and another uniformed constable in tow. I was shooed out of the kitchen and into my study, where Slack soon joined me. P.C. Hurst tells me the dead woman used to be in service here, he began without preamble. Before I could reply, there was a tap at the French windows leading into the garden. There stood Miss Marple, carrying her gardening gloves and a pair of secateurs. In spite of Slack's tutting, I opened the door. In the absence of a lawyer, I felt the need of some moral support. I couldn't help noticing the police arriving, she said, stepping inside. So indiscreet, those black Mariahs. No need for discretion when a woman's been beaten to death, Slack said shortly. Miss Marple's expression reflected surprise, but none of the tremulous horror one might expect in an elderly spinster. My neighbour is made of sterner stuff, as I had discovered after Colonel Prothero's murder in the very room we stood in. How distressing, she said. But who has been murdered? I know it can't be dear Griselda or Flora, for I saw them driving off earlier this morning. They've taken David to Chipping Marlbury to visit Griselda's parents, I said automatically. According to P.C. Hurst, the victim is Mary Hill, Slack interrupted in his most brusque manner. Now Miss Marple did look shocked. Mary? But what was she doing here? That's what I'd like to know, Slack turned to me. Had she made an appointment to see you? I shook my head. No, she didn't even come to church, not since she handed in her notice. She went to work for Miss Hartnell, and I've only ever spoken to her since when she answered the door there. Was she a friend of your maid? Flora, is it? Not that I'm aware. Miss Marple nodded. Flora is far too sensible a girl to waste her time with Mary. Why Mary should be murdered in your kitchen is indeed a puzzle. Slack circled the subject for a few minutes, getting no further forward. He asked where I'd been before my discovery, and I was able to provide a list of parishioners I'd visited. He made a great performance of noting their names and addresses, which served to make me feel guilty even though I knew myself to be entirely innocent of any assault on Mary. At last, he left us alone. I think I should pay a visit of condolence to Miss Hartnell, I said. Indeed, Vicar. But she may not know about Mary's death yet. Miss Marple stood up. If you don't mind, I should like to accompany you. Sometimes another woman's presence helps in the breaking of tragic news. I have always found Miss Marple impossible to refuse. She is never bossy like Miss Hartnell, nor autocratic like Mrs. Price Ridley, nor guilt-inducing like Miss Weatherby. But when she wants something, she has the knack of making it seem inevitable. I think, Vicar, we should leave by the garden and take the back lane, she continued. The police car on your doorstep will have roused the curiosity of everyone in the village, and we should have to satisfy that several times over before we could draw close to our destination.'
as we approached Miss Hartnell's garden, I could see that she, like Miss Marple, was using the cover of pruning her roses to keep the vicarage under scrutiny. No sooner had we come into hailing distance than she popped upright with a speed usually only called into service to terrorise the local youth. Vicar, she boomed, I see the constabulary are at your door. Has there been a burglary? Miss Marple put a hand on the garden gate. Might we come in, my dear? I think we could all do with a cup of tea. Miss Hartnell snorted. You may have to make it yourself, Jane. Mary seems to have flounced off in one of her sulks. She's been nowhere to be seen since she cleared away the coffee cups after Matilda Murchiston dropped by. You know Matilda, Vicar, the romantic novelist? I've no time for that nonsense myself, but the young women seem to swallow all that nonsense wholesale. I, I'm afraid, I stopped not feeling entirely comfortable delivering my news among the gladioli and the dahlias and the talk of romance. I often underestimate the steel under the tweeds when it comes to my older female parishioners. Mary's not sulking, my dear. Mary's been murdered, Miss Marple said, her tone entirely lacking in drama. Miss Hartnell's jaw dropped, revealing large yellow teeth that would have been more at home in the mouth of Colonel Bantry's favourite hunter. Mary, murdered? There must be some mistake, Jane. What motive could anyone have for murdering Mary? It's not as if she's got the brains to be a threat to anyone, or enough personality to provoke a murderous thought. It appeared that the concept of never speaking ill of the dead fell into abeyance when the dead were of the servant class. Nevertheless, Miss Marple continued, murdered she has been. Good Lord, Miss Hartnell harumphed again, I think this calls for something stronger than tea. A small sherry, anyone? Before I could refuse, Miss Hartnell had swept indoors, her neighbour at her heels. She headed for the decanter and glasses that sat on the sideboard, but, as she poured, Miss Marple spoke again. Might we take a quick look at Mary's room? Miss Hartnell frowned. Isn't that the police's job? Of course, but Inspector Slack won't look at it with a woman's eye. It may be that you and I might notice something he'd overlook. Miss Marple was at her meekest. If Griselda had been present, I knew she'd have been struggling to keep a straight face. Brilliant, Jane. You have such a sharp mind. Come, let's take a look. Miss Hartnell led the way down the hall and through the kitchen to a tiny room I suspect may once have been a pantry. Between the single bed, the single wardrobe and the bedside chest of drawers, there was scant room for the two women, so I stayed on the threshold. Miss Marple studied the room, taking in the clumsy watercolour of a woodland glade and the small mirror. She opened the top drawer of the chest and took out a bundle of picture postcards. All but the topmost were held in place by an elastic band. She turned the bundle over. Even from where I was standing, I could see the cancelled stamp and the ill-educated hand. From Bill, she said. Presumably Bill Archer. Miss Hartnell stuck her chin out defensively. I refuse to allow Mary to speak to him on the telephone. Instead, he sent her postcards, confirming their meetings and passing on news. You read them? I asked. One could scarcely avoid it. Miss Hartnell was frosty. And they were delivered to my house, after all. Miss Marple paid no heed to this exchange. Instead... She was frowning at the loose card. Most interesting, she murmured, replacing them all in the drawer. There was apparently nothing else of interest in the drawers, for she turned next to the wardrobe, going through all the pockets methodically. Apart from a couple of handkerchiefs, her search revealed nothing. Thank you, my dear, 
she said, moving inexorably towards the door, causing Miss Hartnell and me to reverse clumsily. And now for the sherry, if you please. We returned to the sitting room. I'm not in the habit of drinking before lunch, but the prospect of that meal seemed to have disappeared from the agenda, so I took what was offered gladly. Who would do such a thing? Miss Hartnell said at regular intervals between sips. She seemed to require no answer, but Miss Marple did inquire as to whether there were any other men who came calling for Mary. Our hostess snorted in derision. Hardly, Jane. What Bill Archer saw in her was a mystery to me. Bill was hardly a great catch, I dared to point out. Miss Marple gave me an indulgent look. You are quite unworldly, Vicar. Before I could argue the point, the doorbell pealed. Miss Hartnell sighed deeply and got to her feet. I shall have to find another maid now, she complained. She returned with Inspector Slack bustling at her back. Vicar, what are you doing here? Conveying the tragic news of Mary's death to her employer, I said. He glowered at Miss Marple. And you, Miss Marple? I hope you're not interfering with police business again. I came to pass on my condolences, she said sharply. She swallowed the last of her sherry and got to her feet. And now I will be on my way. I was torn between waiting to hear whether Slack had made any progress and the desire to discover what had so interested Miss Marple about the loose postcard in Mary's drawer. But I could attempt to draw Miss Marple out at any time, whereas Slack was a very different proposition. So I followed him and Miss Hartnell to Mary's room. I glanced back at Miss Marple, who seemed to be gazing into the middle distance towards the bow window that gave on to the street. On the threshold of Mary's room, Slack brusquely dismissed us both. There's no need for you to be interfering with the scene of the crime. Don't you have parishioners to visit, Vicar? Or did you manage to squeeze them all in this morning? I caught up with Miss Marple on the path to the gate, where she had paused to admire the late bloomers in the herbaceous border. Once we were clear of Miss Hartnell's cottage, I ventured to ask what she had found so interesting in Mary's room. She smiled sweetly. Dear Vicar, little escapes you. What struck me was that the stamp on the card had not been franked. You mean it hadn't come through the post? It would appear not. It's my guess that Archer had written it but not posted it before he died, and that Mary found it yesterday afternoon when she visited his cottage for the first time since his death. What did it say? She closed her eyes, as if summoning the image up before her. Big surprise in the woods today. Might be we can turn it to a profit. She blinked and smiled. And that's all. No clue as to what he meant. One can speculate. I can think of at least three or four possibilities, can't you? But no, there was nothing more specific than that. We had almost reached Miss Marple's gate when something dawned on me. But if that was all it said, why would anyone feel sufficiently threatened by it to kill Mary? That is the question, is it not? And so saying, she turned in at her gate and left me none the wiser. Griselda returned shortly before six, accompanied by an exhausted and fractious David. I ruffled his hair affectionately as Flora whisked him off to bath and bed. How are your parents? I asked. They grow duller and more narrow-minded with age, she sighed. It unnerves me somewhat when Griselda says such things. It's as if she forgets that I am significantly closer in age to her parents than to her. My perennial fear is that she will come to think the same of me. She caught my moment's apprehension, read my mind, and leaned in to kiss my cheek. 
Don't be silly, Len. You know it's my mission in life to keep you forever young. She yawned. I'm worn out, she complained. My father excites David so with his model soldiers, and then my mother fills him with sweets and lemonade till the poor boy is beside himself. Once he gets to fever pitch, they can't cope and suddenly find something terribly urgent that must be done elsewhere and leave me to deal with the child. She made for the study door. Where are you going? I demanded more sharply than I'd intended. Griselda stopped and stared at me. To the kitchen, to heat up the pie Flora prepared for dinner. You can't. You mustn't. You can't go into the kitchen. It's... It's out of bounds. My wife looked at me as if I was mad. Why ever not? How can we have dinner if the kitchen is out of bounds? Before I could reply, Flora's scream answered for me. Griselda raced to the kitchen, where Flora stood wailing, her apron over her face. The b b blood, the b blood, she hiccuped. Griselda looked at the puddle of congealed blood on the floor then looked at me. There's blood all over the floor. I know. That's why I was trying to stop you going into the kitchen. Len, what on earth has been going on here? It took some time to explain what had happened, to persuade Flora not to hand in her notice on the spot, and then to calm David, who was near hysterical, at the non-arrival of his bedtime milk and biscuits. The person apparently least affected was Griselda, whose ill-suppressed excitement was only augmented by the return of Dennis from the much Benham police station at the end of his shift. "'Have you arrested anyone?' Griselda demanded. Dennis threw himself into an armchair and shook his head. No, not likely to either. Slack is beside himself. We've not turned up a single clue or a single witness who saw either Mary or her killer enter or leave the vicarage. That's hard to credit, Griselda remarked, given the old pussy's network of observation posts. It must have happened at that point in the morning where they're all busy making sure their maids polish the light bulbs, Dennis said. More to the point. I said, it seems impossible to imagine who could have had a motive for murdering Mary. Except possibly Miss Hartnell, Griselda said. But if she wanted never to have to face one of Mary's cremated roasts again, she could simply have given her notice. This is not a matter for facetiousness, I scolded. Mary has been brutally dispatched in the very kitchen she once counted home. Griselda had the grace to look ashamed. I'm sorry, Len. It's my way of coping. Before I could accept her apology, Flora showed in Miss Marple. She fluttered on the threshold for a moment, then stepped inside. My dear Griselda, how terrible for you. More terrible for Mary, Griselda said and for poor Flora, who's on her knees trying to scrub the blood stain off the kitchen floor. Of course, and quite disturbing for you, Dennis, your first murder. She paused and frowned. At least, I suppose it is your first. Dennis straightened in his seat. It brings home the importance of what we do. Indeed. Miss Marple turned back to Griselda and smiled apologetically. I'm sorry to intrude at a time like this, but I wondered whether you were still planning to go into much Benham tomorrow, only I had rather counted on being able to visit the chemist. Good heavens, yes. I don't think Mary would have expected us to go into formal mourning. Her mission achieved, I showed Miss Marple out through the study. By the way, what was it that caught your attention through the window at Miss Hartnell's? I asked as I wrestled with the awkward bolt. A momentary look of puzzlement was followed by the dawning of comprehension. Oh, but Vicar, it wasn't the window I was looking at. And without further ado, she was gone. <laughs>
I stared after her, trying to imagine what she had noticed that had escaped both me and Inspector Slack. To one side of the window was a small mahogany bookshelf holding a dozen or so volumes, to the other a console table with a shallow bowl containing a few calling cards. Surely even Miss Marple could not have managed to decipher any of those at that distance. As was so often the case with my neighbour, Miss Marple had mystified me again. Astonishingly, life at the vicarage appeared to have returned to normal by the next morning. Flora served breakfast, David recounted a somewhat confused version of a Rupert Bear story, and Griselda complained about having to make jam for the next meeting of the Mother's Union. I retired to my study to labour over the week's sermon, and no police officers interrupted our day. Over lunch, Griselda entertained me with her outing to Much Benham. One curious thing, she said. Miss Marple disappeared into Goodenough's for at least fifteen minutes and came out without a book. That's odd, don't you think? To visit a bookshop and come out empty-handed? They're not always well stocked. I tried to buy you the new Matilda Murchiston the other week and they didn't have it, even though she's a well-known local author. I was quite taken aback. It's not as if she's a shrinking violet. She always seems to be giving talks to one organisation or another, and those pugs of hers must have chewed half the rugs in the shire. Perhaps Goodenoughs didn't have what Miss Marple was looking for. Did you ask her? She was very evasive. Griselda helped herself to a second serving of the chicken pie we should have had the previous evening. Oh, by the way, in all the kerfuffle yesterday, I forgot to tell you I ran into Jeremy Jenner in Chipping Marlbury. He was delivering election leaflets to my parents. You know he's standing in the by-election there next week. I could hardly have failed to know. We'd recently had Jenner and his wife to dinner at the vicarage, out of obligation, and he had spoken of little else. He claimed his experience in business had led the Prime Minister to promise him a cabinet post if elected. Do your parents think he'll win? Griselda pulled a face. A Gloucester old spot with the right party rosette could take that seat. As Flora came in with the apple crumble, Dennis slipped in behind her. Greetings, family. I'm supposed to be checking whether there's any sign of Mary having left a note for the vicar, but I thought I might seize the moment and grab some pudding. On duty, I said. He's entitled to a lunch break, surely, Len, Griselda gave Dennis a conspiratorial wink. I gave in and gestured to his usual chair. He'd started pouring the custard onto his heaped bowl when Flora returned with Miss Marple once more. She apologised profusely for interrupting us at table. Griselda told her she was always welcome, with a slight trace of grit in her voice, and Dennis carried on eating regardless. I know it's very rude of me, but when I saw Dennis go in at your gate, I thought I should take advantage of the opportunity to share my discovery. A discovery? How exciting, Griselda said. Is it to do with the murder? It's certainly to do with a murder. I happened to take a walk in Old Hall Woods before lunch, and I came upon something I think the police ought to see. And you know, Vicar, how hard it can be to capture Inspector Slack's attention? She twinkled at me, reminding me of previous experiences with the inspector. So I thought I might direct our very own constable to what I'd found. Best to leave it in place, you see. Dennis regarded his half-full bowl with regret, wiped his mouth with his napkin, and pushed his chair back with a sigh. No time like the present. With a last look of regret, he led the way out of the room. Poor Dennis missing out on his treat, Griselda said. He doesn't know it yet, but his standing is about to rise, I told her. Miss Marple is the last person I'd accuse of wasting police time. <laughs>
It was the book that set me on the right track, Miss Marple said, sipping a post-prandial cherry brandy in the vicarage sitting room later that evening. Events had proceeded at a remarkable rate after she'd shown her find to Dennis. Two people were already under arrest. But you didn't buy a book, Griselda said. I didn't buy a book because Goodenoughs had already sold the only copy they'd had. Native fungi of the home counties. I'd spotted it in Miss Hartnell's much-neglected bookcase, and it struck me as very odd, since she has never shown any interest in unregimented nature. It looked very new, and I noticed it had good enough sticker on the base of the spine. It made me wonder. You wondered about Archer? She smiled. Exactly, Vicar. Archer had been living off the land all his life. The idea that he would pick poisonous mushrooms for a stew seemed absurd, but to add them to his stew after the fact would be easy, I thought. His cottage is not in the best repair, and it would take little effort to get inside via one of the windows. The card he wrote to Mary but failed to post clearly indicated a plan to blackmail someone, but to do that effectively, you must be sure your victim lacks the courage or the desperation to put a stop to you. And that's where Archer went fatally wrong. But who and why, Griselda demanded. Ignoring her, Miss Marple continued. One would have to be certain of the poison, so the killer had to consult a reliable guide. Once it had served its purpose, his accomplice secreted it in Miss Hartnell's bookcase. If any suspicion had arisen, placing it there would have pointed straight at Mary. Miss Marple pursed her lips. Such wickedness! But who bought the book? Griselda's voice was noticeably higher in pitch now. Jeremy Jenner. I had no difficulty believing Jenna capable of almost anything in defence of his seat, but Griselda frowned. He can't have killed Mary. We spoke to him in Chipping Marlbury yesterday morning. He was canvassing for the by-election. He couldn't possibly have been attacking Mary in the vicarage. No, dear, Jeremy Jenner is not the kind of man who does his own dirty work. That fell to his partner in crime— and I venture, his partner in adultery. I imagine Archer came upon them in the woods and thought, as he said in his card to Mary, that there might be some profit in it. I imagine that Jenner and his lover decided murder was preferable to having the sword of Damocles dangling perpetually over their heads, and so they hatched their plot. His accomplice poisoned the stew, and they thought that was the end of it. Who was it? Griselda demanded. And why kill Mary? Surely they were safe with Archer dead. Miss Marple shook her head sadly. Mary was struggling to believe Archer could have made so stupid a mistake, and his message convinced her he'd been killed. She wondered whether she'd be able to convince the police to take her seriously. So she sought advice from the wrong person. The woman she spoke to tried to persuade her not to go to the police, but Mary still had her doubts. She gave me a kind glance. I believe she came here to ask your wise counsel, Vicar, and that she was followed by her killer. Griselda was literally on the edge of her seat. Who was it? Miss Marple raised her index finger. All in good time, Griselda. I believed I had unravelled the plot, but there was still no direct evidence. I wondered whether there might be something apparently insignificant at Archer's cottage that the police had missed, something that might not seem meaningful to a man. Something a woman might leave behind, I asked. Something a woman might not notice she'd left behind. Archer's pantry has a small window that's hidden from view by a rosa rugosa, and on closer inspection I noticed a strip of fine cotton muslin had snagged on the thorns. 
I recognised the distinctive fabric at once, for I'd been in Miss Pollitt's sewing-room only a couple of weeks before when its owner happened to pick her dress up. It is, I expect, unique, not least because it has a strip torn from its very full skirt. I pointed it out to Dennis, and Inspector Slack whirled into action. Now Jeremy Jenner and his mistress are occupying cells in much Benham police station. Griselda groaned. Stop torturing me, Miss Marple. Tell us who murdered Mary. Matilda Murchiston. We both stared, open-mouthed at our neighbour. The local celebrity author, doyenne of the romantic novelists, famously devoted to her husband and her pugs, a cold-blooded killer. It was beyond belief. I almost said, there must be some mistake, and then remembered just in time who I was dealing with. Miss Marple drained her glass and stood up. This has been a shocking and tragic affair, dear vicar. Let us hope this will be the final murder at the vicarage. <laughs>